Now, I wonder if we could ask our uh, two uh, panelists uh, who are going to give us an insight into the pitfalls of lobbying the Ray government. These are two of the best, uh, Graham Scott and Carl Jaffrey, um, who have had uh, a variety of experiences um, uh, at uh, various levels of government. Uh, Carl Jaffrey is a counsel to the law firm of Ga Stra Gowling, Strathy and Henderson here in Toronto. Um, he's uh, well known as a former uh, municipal councillor, a federal vice president of the NDP. Uh, he has a considerable experience in housing, rent review and public administration. Uh, he's prepared studies on rent control and housing policy for governments in Saskatchewan and British Columbia. He was a member of the Harbour Commission. Um, and he's uh, an expert in port and other municipal matters. And uh, he will, I know, eschew this designation, but he is here as, as having some, some knowledge of what makes the NDP uh, tick and the NDP government at Queen's Park tick. Um, Graham Scott uh, also brings a, an interesting background. Uh, uh, in addition to being a former vice president of the Student Council at the University of Western Ontario, uh, he then moved on and up in the world as he became executive assistant to Robert Stanfield in Ottawa. And, uh, and uh, he then moved from there into the public service, a distinguished career in the public service of Ontario, the Ministry of the Attorney General, then Deputy Minister of the Environment. And he concluded uh, with a bang with that very non-controversial, low-spending, uh, low-profile department, the Ministry of Health. Uh, where he finished his public service career in 1984, Graham, and uh, saw the light and finally went into private practice uh, with uh, Macmillan Binch, uh, where he now serves. And I should say, Graham was recently appointed by the Prime Minister of Canada in a voluntary capacity to co-chair a group to tackle the impossible task of reducing spend expenditure in government. And uh, he now holds that position in addition to his professional duties. Gentlemen, um, which one of you would like to go first? I, I notice in Carl's remarks he refers to me as something I will be saying, so I think Carl probably should go first. Carl, you're on. <laughs> um, just before getting on to the things I thought about saying, I wanted to do a footnote to David Smith's uh, remarks about what happens in Washington compared with what happens in, uh, in Ontario. I was in Washington 10 days ago with a little group that was trying to learn how to lobby in Washington. They're a group that's interested in community information, and this was the first time they'd met in Washington, and they were going around talking to various people, all of whom were saying, well, what's your legislative agenda? And they didn't really know what it was, so people showed them what a legislative agenda should be. They got a little kit, for example, from the um, oh, American Association of Housing and Renewal Officials, and it has a band around it, and it says legislative agenda, and you open it up, and there's a brochure, and it says there are five points. Uh, title such and so housing for nonprofit should have $928 million this year. And then title something else should have $829 million. And then a particular title of the uh, income revenue code for tax exemption should be continued. And, you know, they got five points, and there they are. And um, after the little brochure, then there are five brochures, one about each point, saying why it's a good thing. And all of the members of this association go around and see all their congressmen and all their senators. And if they don't see the senator or the congressman, there's a directory that looks like the yellow pages that has the pictures of each congressman and senator. It says who all their staff are and what each staff responsibility is, so you know just who to go and talk to. And there it is. And then, as David says, you, you try and build the coalition to do the thing you want. Coming home from Washington, I read Patty Starr's book on the plane. And that explained how you do it in Ontario. And uh, <laughs> it, it, it's all little bundles of money wrapped up to look like steaks that you leave in somebody's refrigerator and, um, and, and call girls on demand for the politicians. And it, it seemed to me there was something to be said for the Washington approach, you know? Um, <laughs> at least everybody comes right out and says what they're for and what they want and why. Um, I thought. As, as opposed to talking just about lobbying the Ray government, we should talk a bit about what lobbying is. And you've heard a good deal from, from David and from, uh, from Ron, um, and those were good. Um, there were a, few, a time a few years ago when the city of Toronto decided lobbying should be regulated, so they passed a quite, I think, unconstitutional statute about, or bylaw about lobbyist registration. 
which we generally tried to follow. They've, I'm glad to say, now repealed it because they created a registry that people put things in, and it turned out after four years no one had ever looked in it, and it really didn't tell anybody anything much. Jane Pepino checked some definitions of lobbying and found some that she thought meant that lobbying itself was odious, so she would never admit to doing any lobbying at all. She filed her form, but she claimed she had never lobbied anybody. She had just attended on them to give information. And there is much to be said for that position. Um, you are advocating, but you are mostly providing information. I think what you're probably trying to do is persuade the government to exercise some discretion in some fashion or other, but it can be anything from um, passing legislation or repealing legislation or changing regulations or even approving your client under a particular program. Sometimes it's just trying to speed up the process. And I've said in here that the first thing you really have to do is ask yourself whether what your client wants you to do is even possible. An example that I have given is trying to get anything done about rent control. Uh, and I've made the point that if, if arguments about why rent control didn't work and why it was a bad public policy uh, had any weight, uh, we wouldn't have any rent control. Uh, however, it would have been impossible to persuade the Peterson government not to continue rent control in some form. And it is quite impossible to persuade the Ray government that rent control should not continue. And it may be impossible to persuade any government that rent control should not continue because tenants think it's a good idea. So I'm trying to make the point that you have to see what it is your client wants you to do and figure out whether you have any possible hope of success. And this often may involve a, uh, a process of working back and forth with your client as you try and decide what you can possibly achieve. Your client may want what you can possibly achieve more than what exists at the moment. And if that's all right, you can take it on. But um, clients often come to you with far higher expectations for what can be achieved with government than I think are, are practical or, or can take place. Um, so if you're asked to do something you can't do, don't take the retainer. And, and as you work away on what you are being asked to do, I think you have to keep on reevaluating what the um, um, what the prospects of success are and what it is your client may want you to do. Now, in order to do anything, the first thing you have to do is plan a strategy and obtain information on where your client's matter now sits on the government's agenda. Maybe you're too late. Maybe a decision's just been made against you. Um, maybe it's on the back burner and moving it up is what you have to do. Maybe it's good timing, but that's something you have to find out. And I've asked the question, how do you find out? And the obvious answer is that you have to go to those responsible and ask them. If you were the, the absolute ideal lobbyist that doesn't exist, you would know on a first name basis everybody in the government phone book. You know what they did. You'd call them up and you'd ask them. Nobody except perhaps my fellow panelists knows people that well. So you end up going into the system wherever you can. Either you take the government phone book, which is an invaluable resource. You, you absolutely must have a government phone book for any level of government you're ever trying to deal with. It gives you what is known as the order of battle. Uh, it shows who is everybody's boss and who is their boss and how the system works. And so it's, it's a diagram that you work from. And you go into that, and you either find somebody you know who has some vague connection with the issue, and you phone them to see if they'll tell you anything, or you try and figure out who, who it is, and you call them cold. Um, and in, in this kind of conversation, I think we have the advantage of a form of government where it's perfectly permissible for anyone to call a civil servant at any time and say, I'm inquiring about your policy of licensing people to run casinos, or I'm inquiring about your policy of grants for telecommunication improvements, or what can you tell me? And you're, you will usually begin to be told quite a lot of information. There may be policy statements you can have. 
it'll take you some time to home in and, and be up to speed on your client's matter. But asking questions is what you do. And you ask those of either people you know or people who you think are involved. I've said that I think a major drawback of people practicing law uh, doing this kind of work is that we are sometimes threatening to civil servants or we are viewed as being threatening. And when we introduce ourselves as lawyers, that can strike fear into a civil servant's heart. They may think they're going to get sued for something or someone's criticizing them or something like that. None of that helps. You want to approach these things as a humble seeker after information. Um, in that connection, it is my experience that friendly, non-threatening people who can make friends over the phone are often most successful at lobbying. Governments have taken formal steps to avoid gender bias discrimination for decades. The result is that government service has been an attractive career path for able women for some time, and many of the civil servants you will deal with will therefore be professional women. I find that women are often much better than I am at establishing a positive, pleasant relationship with the civil servants having carriage of my client's matter. I should say at this point as well that I think there is much to be said for a team, a team of lawyers, a team of people in your own office doing any of this work. Um, this is work that will require quite an investment of time, time on the telephone, time talking back and forth to a variety of people. Um, those of us who do litigation may be used to the system of throwing everything into the other guy's court and then knowing that until he hits the ball back, you don't have to do anything. Send off all your letters and wait for replies, fine. Doesn't work in this kind of work. You, you are wanting to phone to say, I'm writing you a letter, and then you're going, to say, and you're going to explain what the letter says, and then you're going to send the letter, and then you're going to phone to say, did you get the letter? And then you're going to phone to say, could we have a meeting to discuss how you might respond to the letter? You are going to be um, uh, what I call schmoozing quite a lot. I gather some people think schmoozing is just talk that isn't going anywhere. You're going somewhere, but you're often having to go somewhere quite slowly and quite carefully, and it will be time consuming. And if you're off trying to appear before the racing commission or do a three-week three OMB hearing at the same time, it often isn't done best by running out at the morning coffee break and trying to phone four people. It, it may be very important to have two people at least, and maybe more than that, in your office who are all on top of this thing that you're trying to do and can, can keep the phone calls coming and keep the, um, keep the agenda in shape. The, uh, one of the things that makes work for lobbyists is the fact that governments are large, Many issues impact on more than one ministry, or at least on different divisions of the same ministry, and politicians and their political staffs are often interested in the outcome as well. I've had considerable success in obtaining allocations of funding for a nonprofit housing group, where the role of the lobbyist was one of constantly checking back and forth among the staff of the Ministry of Housing, the Ministry of Community and Social Services, the Ministry of the Environment, and the political staffs of both a cabinet minister and a backbench member. These were all people who had something to do with the decision, and the person who had to actually make the decision felt constrained because he or she was not getting input from these other people who were known to be interested but were not saying, yes, we've signed off, it's okay. And so negotiating back and forth with those people is, is sometimes very important. Um, I gave the example of a person holding up an approval because they can't get an assurance from another ministry that some funding will be available for a program in the future or that there will never be a fire hazard in a particular building design or something like that. Of course, they can never have any of those absolute assurances, so what you end up with is a bit of negotiation. Well. Um, Maybe we won't know that there will be funding in the future for that program, but do we know that the ministry at least hopes to be able to expand that program? And would that be enough if they told you that? Um, fire, well, all right, there is an industrial building within 50 meters, but um, if, if we totally protect with sprinklers and we uh, 
minimize windows on one side of our building, would that be enough? It's that kind of thing that you're going through quite a lot. The fact that it is taking a lot of time, by the way, means that um, you're going to have to be paid well. You will have trouble if you negotiate upset fees. You will be keep taking, keeping track of a lot of time. And um, I think one of the problems of lobbying is that it's something that only wealthy clients can afford. One of my favorite bills that I think I ever sent out was to professional services um, for arranging for the Citizenship Act of Canada to be amended so as to qualify you for citizenship, my fee $29.75. The bill obviously was something of a joke. The client was a secretary of mine who told me about her problem. I met the minister socially a little while later. He said, we're on the point of changing that. That's awful, but may I use your client's, your, your secretary's, example when describing it to a commons committee as to how unfair this is and I said sure so the whole thing had a time um, commitment from my point of view of all of 20 minutes and I sent the bill out for a joke but people who need the citizenship act change simply can't afford to hire a lobbyist to do it and we do um, have the problem of people of creating a system where only um, uh, only well-financed clients really can take advantage of it. Um, the, uh, I discuss a little bit the tactic about going over somebody's head, whether going to the politician or whether going to the person's boss. I quite agree with David Smith that you start with the person who's supposed to be doing it, and you go over their head only with reluctance. And you go over their head only when you can tell them that it's important to the client and the client requires you to go over their head. And I have said here that for, you never go over their head unless uh, one of two things happens, but one of the two things cover all possibilities, so it's okay. Um, one of the things is where the civil servant has a discretion to exercise and you think they're exercising it or may exercise it incorrectly, and you may ask to discuss that with their, their supervisor. Uh, the other is where there is some policy that prevents them from doing what you want, in which case you go over their head to try and discuss changing the policy. But I quite agree that before you do that, you tell them that's what you're going to do. You even may ask them to be at the meeting with the superior. You, you, you don't burn bridges behind you. I've said that as you listen to all this, you may ask yourself when the real lobbying takes place, when does one go and talk to the politicians or call in old markers, do all the things that lobbyists are accused of. Uh, some of our colleagues spend a good deal of their time raising campaign funds for politicians. I personally believe that those who do this have easier access to politicians. Politicians can't refuse to talk to their finance chair. Those are relationships that I think are perceived by the public as being distasteful. Um, my view is that you, you never go to anyone asking for favors. Uh, you, you go asking them to help you. You go asking for the opportunity to help them make sound decisions in the public interest. When you go to pol politicians, I'm not quite with David Smith on that. Um, I think I may be closer to Ron Atkey. If you're cause is dear to the heart of a politician or can be made dear to the heart of a politician, if the politics are on your side, then I think telling the politicians about it is an important thing to do. Uh, I think, however, you tell the staff that you're going to do that, that your client wants to talk to the minister, that it seems to be something the minister would like, so you let them know that beforehand. And what that sometimes results in, of course, is the minister or the minister's staff asking a question um, or asking for a report from someone in the, in the ministry. And the person in the ministry first will be glad to know where that came from, will be glad to know it's coming, will be glad to be in a position to respond quickly and, and, and helpfully. And I think all things considered, if the, uh, the ministry staff is wondering what its policy should be, and noises begin coming down from the minister's office saying that the minister would be delighted if the policy went in this direction, that doesn't hurt you. So 
I like to talk or have my client talk. I again agree with David Smith. The client's the best person to do it. And if the client can, the client should do the talking with the ministry, with the minister. But you do that when, when you have the politics on your side. Um, David also talked a little about talking to political staff as opposed to talking to staff in the ministry. And there is one of the distinctions, I think, between the current Ray government uh, and the governments that I've seen in, in Queen's Park before. Um, at least in some ministries, the Ray government hired political staff who knew something about the subject, which tended not to be the case, uh, certainly in my experience with earlier governments. Political staff usually was there with earlier governments to hold the minister's coat, help the minister do her speech or his speech, um, certainly be quite aware of the minister's political agenda, but not necessarily know anything about the subject matter. Um, the NDP in a number of minister, new ministers in a number of ministries went out and hired quite capable people who then got into fairly vigorous conflicts between their views and those of the um, established civil servants in that ministry and, uh, and had to be taken much more seriously as, as policy development people by the ministry than had been the case in the past. That may be sorting down a little bit. It, it, it certainly gave rise to a good deal of conflict. Um, those decisions about the, the Art Gallery of Ontario, for example, and its funding uh, seem to, to have some of their basis in uh, those kinds of staff appointments. And um, it does mean that if, if, if you go to ministry staff, you, you may, with this government, find, find people who are prepared to take on the bureaucracy in a, a way that has not normally been my experience. I think you should do it as a last resort. I think you, you want to deal with the, uh, the ministry staff if you're getting what you want from them. In any event, I, I concluded that if what you want is fair, just, wise, and beautiful, but it doesn't fit the political agenda of the government, then you would be best not try, trying not to include politicians in what you're doing and indeed try and get what you're doing through without anybody noticing it a great deal. Um, the, uh, I know Graham's going to make the point about uh, trying to figure out what the political agenda of the government is, um, and their biases will be extremely important. Um, I've said one thing I think is different about the NDP government and others is that they probably believe in their political agenda with a, a, a religious fervor that is probably not found in most governments. So there are going to be some things with this government that are just taken as read no matter what. Um, they know the rich have too, mu too much money. They know rent control and more public housing are good things, regardless of vacancy rates and anything else. They know that collective agreements should not be abrogated by governments, and, and so on. Um, so. You have to try and get a sense of these, either from, either from the newspaper or from the people you talk to on a day-to-day -day basis, and you have to work around them. Or you have to realize that some of them may be believed so strongly that you can't change their minds about them. And I think that's something where the, uh, the NDP and uh, certainly the liberals, and in my experience the conservatives, tend to be far more pragmatic about those basic tenants of belief. Now, I don't know, with the last six months of the NDP finding out about deficits and finding out about collective agreements, uh, who knows where they may be now moving. I, I'm, I'm not about to predict. I would have thought they might simply go on holding to their other beliefs even more strongly. Um, the, um, I think that probably I should, I should wrap up. I've gone on longer than I, I was intended to. I've ended up with a, a statement that I think lobbyists should always remember, um, which is that there aren't any problems without solutions. If your problem doesn't have a solution, it's not a problem. It's a fact. And the only way you can deal with facts is to face them. And that's probably what we have to decide with this government. What is a problem and what is a fact, and then live with it. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Before calling on Graham, I will remind you uh, there will be opportunities for questions. Uh, we'll save your questions for Carl until after Graham has finished, and then you can fire at both of them. Graham? 
Thank you, Ron. Uh, I'm perhaps going to step a little bit back from uh, a lot of what we've heard really as the lawyer, as the uh, advocate, and talk a little bit about some of the broader macro uh, strategic uh, considerations. Before I do that, I wanted to make a couple of, uh, of personal comments, uh, which I think have been touched on before. But one is that I think uh, lobbying in the, uh, in the law firm is really a teamwork exercise. It's uh, teamwork with your fellow partners with their expertise in, uh, in uh, uh, the more, some of the more traditional uh, areas of practice. It's, uh, it's teamwork often with, uh, with outside consultants who bring uh, special skills to the table that are neither available in law firms nor in, or with the, uh, in the, on the client's strength. The other thing I wanted to say, because no one else has said it, and that is that my general view of life is that most lawyers uh, choose their area of practice because they really enjoy doing it. I mean, even tax lawyers apparently enjoy it. <laughs> and I thought it would be remiss to say that, uh, that uh, I think I speak for more than myself when I say that I think lobbying is a hell of a lot of fun. And uh, the reason I think I can say that with, uh, with some confidence is that uh, on the platform and, uh, and in the room, I see people that on various issues uh, I've worked with them and, uh, or against them. And uh, it's been uh, both challenging, uh, exciting, but, uh, but above, all, uh, above all fun to do it as, uh, as most, good briefs, uh, most good briefs are. Uh, because it lets you uh, play in environmental matters uh, with mining companies. It may get you on the edge of product liability litigation, uh, plant closures. Uh, or even indeed uh, spending a great deal of time with American clients trying to persuade them not to do what all their natural instincts suggest they should do. Um, turning to, uh, to sort of a broad uh, perspective, I guess the first thing I think that you need to try and develop as best you can um, is what I would call that bilingual capacity. All good lobbyists have to be bilingual. That is, they have to speak private sector and they have to speak public sector and they have to speak it rather fluently. Um, this is something that uh, one ought not ever to misunderstand. And yet it is, I suppose, the most common problem that I think ari arises in relationships. Um, governments march to a different drummer uh, uh, than a private sector business, for example. They use a different language. They have different reporting relationships. And generally, they have far more complex relationships that they have to deal with. And if you misinterpret some of the things they say or do, which is very natural to them, then you have a problem. You also have a problem, of course, if uh, they, in trying to deal with your language, interpret in their own and uh, reach some difficulty. So you have to be uh, constantly aware of, uh, of those, that there are two languages at work uh, when you're dealing in a uh, in a, in a lobbying relationship. As you'll see from my notes, and I'm not going to go through them, but just to deal with some of the headings, uh, homework is essential. Well, I mean, what could be, uh, what could be more obvious than that? But, uh, you know, I've seen too many people uh, mount their high horse when they sit down with a public servant and remind them about the amount of taxes they pay, how important they are, and uh, that if the government was run like they were run, they wouldn't be having this problem and have to go through the ridiculous necessity of this meeting. Um, I can assure you that it'll take a pack of lobbyists to undo the kind of damage that uh, that, that kind of opening can create. And yet, uh, that is a, uh, a somewhat natural reaction of someone, of a client who sees a problem in black and white when governments are trained uh, in order to survive of seeing grays rather than, uh, rather than blacks or whites. So you've got to do your homework well. The government deserves, uh, deserves no less. And in the category of really getting off on the wrong foot, uh, uh, the other thing you ought to do is leave your personal political philosophies at home. Um, I don't think they matter very much in terms of, uh, of accomplishing what you wish to accomplish, uh, whether you're dealing with an NDP, a conservative, or a liberal government. Uh, but if you give them, deliver some lecture as to the adequacy or inadequacy of their philosophy or their ability to live up to their philosophy, uh, that is not a very constructive way to, uh, to get anything started. Perhaps the uh, most significant thing about uh, government is it's like that Greek many-headed hydra that you, uh, it's not a monolith. I mean, I, governments and the 
pictures that governments project about their policies and their issues uh, are always, always oversimplified. It's just like an election campaign. It's government, no one wants to admit in an election campaign that a subject's too complex to discuss. On the other side of the coin, uh, they know it isn't, and therefore they don't want to discuss it in a complex way because it's hard for people to come to grips with. By the same token, uh, governments uh, put forward fairly simple positions. And if you sit back and accept that and assume that that's closed any kind of door for you, you've really made an enormously big mistake. Governments are anything but monoliths. They are, in fact, representative of practically everything you find in society. And if you don't recognize this and take advantage of it, then you're really letting your client down. I'll give you a simple example. I see in the paper this morning that uh, Toyota has announced that they're going to build an engine plant in Ontario. And I also notice in that that, uh, that there's government money involved in, uh, in, that, uh, in that exercise. I can assure you that the Ministry of, uh, of uh, Economic Development and, and, uh, and Technology uh, probably has been working on that for some months and very enthusiastically and uh, probably the Premier's office is very pleased to be able to show that an industry will actually come to Ontario and expand. So this is important stuff from those people. But what's, let's say you wanted to, uh, to get some changes in that engine plant or you didn't like where it was being located or whatever. Is it all hopeless because uh, MEDT likes it and has put money into it and because the Premier's behind it? Could be. It could be. But Let's look around and see what there is in government, see what your problem may be. If you're uh, in the neighborhood in that part of uh, Cambridge and you think that there's too much air pollution, there's always the Ministry of Environment and Energy. Believe me, even without you bothering to go to them, they will find 10,000 ways to slow down the development of that engine plant. Not because they're against engine plants, but because they'll just put it in their normal pile of process items to deal with. And uh, there will be tensions there, and MEDT will be yelling at them over the next several months, no matter what. I guarantee it. You don't need a lobbyist to be there to tell you that. It'll happen. It'll just happen in the normal operations of government. Uh, uh, labor, for example, uh, most of the uh, Japanese plants uh, build, their, uh, build their operational philosophy around the concept that they don't wish to uh, have a labor union. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, the Ministry of Labor may not have a very different view on this matter or that, uh, or that the labor movement may not be getting some support in attempts to uh, continue to organize uh, such plants. So all I'm trying to say to you is that there are these many different interests and uh, there are thousands of examples. Uh, 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 the government says it wants jobs now. Uh, and the natural, the uh, natural resources uh, department or na uh, northern development and mines department wants to develop a new mine. <coughs> uh, at the same time, the Ministry of Environment will tell you that it wants a five-year environmental assessment. So you've immediately got a problem. How much do you want the jobs? How much do you want to overrun the Environmental Assessment Act? So these are all things that are naturally exist in government uh, before the before the uh, the lobbyist even gets there. And if you're not aware of them and don't know how to, uh, to take advantage of them uh, from whatever perspective you may be, uh, you may be pursuing, then you, uh, then you really are letting down your client. Now, uh, the external environment. I mean, government, the government's main business is constantly changing, or at least appears to be constantly changing, uh, because government, as well as uh, wanting to lead, also wants to be responsive uh, to the public. So there are always changing political themes. And there are always new policy priorities. And uh, again, you better know what these themes are in the policy priorities and, uh, and how they work out. For example, uh, again, the public policy priority may be jobs. Create new jobs in the province. But you better know the themes before you go in with a proposal that's going to create jobs. If, if, if for example, uh, you're in the, uh, in the health care business and you decided that you wanted to uh, make an application for uh, 200 or 300 uh, nursing home beds and, uh, and you know at the moment that there's a shortage of, uh, of beds for nursing home and chronic care, then, uh, then you can go charging into the government. But what about the themes that uh, at the moment uh, they the government believes that public ownership should dominate in this area, not private ownership? Uh, that home care is the number one priority, not, uh, not placing out more beds. 
Again, these aren't necessarily absolute barriers, but if you go in on the assumption that you're going to produce a whole lot of uh, nursing jobs, nursing assistance jobs, and, uh, and spin-off jobs in the community by building a new nursing home, you better think through those themes as well as just a priority for jobs. The internal environment is another area that, uh, that needs a lot of attention, and this perhaps goes back to my comments at the beginning about uh, bilingualism and, uh, and knowing what you're talking about. In times of stress, good companies restructure by getting lean and protecting product quality and product development. Uh, when they sit down there, they say, if we're going to survive this tough period of time, the thing we've got to protect more than anything else is, uh, is our hard product, if that means laying off people, uh, uh, spinning off some operations that we actually enjoy doing, uh, then they face up to it and do it. Governments, for example, have traditionally not approached it that way, uh, unless you assume that their product is, uh, is electability, which it may be. But in terms of their administrative product, uh, they're not inclined to protect it. They're inclined to uh, protect public service jobs and instead squeeze down on the, on the actual product that they're delivering while pretending that they're not. So that's why uh, uh, they tell you that the highways budget uh, increases regularly each year, and it does by a, a few hundred thousand dollars, but somehow the highways seem to be crumbling underneath your car. So um, bear in mind that you've got to understand some of the peculiarities of their internal environment uh, uh, when you're going along. You've got to know some of those internal priorities. Now, at any given time, there's two or three ministries that are the favorites of the government. They're getting more protection from cuts. Uh, they've got certain legislative priorities. And you should always keep your eye on, uh, on what departments they are and what potential they have uh, for the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, uh, product that you're, you're dealing with, the kind of uh, policy change that you want to get, or the, uh, or the kind of in, uh, policy change you're, you're seeking. Uh, so there are some programs that are in ascendancy or, dis or, or that are in descendancy at any, uh, any given time. Uh, for example, uh, and sometimes they last for a long time, I would say for the moment that uh, women's programs and training programs, for example, are obviously in the, uh, in the ascendancy and, uh, and have been uh, for some time. And it would be a mistake to, uh, to ignore the fact that if you have um, angles in your proposal that, uh, that relate to these, then you'd be uh, foolish to, uh, to ignore them. Uh, on, the other, uh, on the other hand, uh, programs that aren't in the ascendancy very clearly are things like capital infrastructure upgrading and uh, reg regulatory reform. Um, one of the points I make here is where is the government in its budgetary year? Well, uh, this is very important because uh, at various times in a budgetary year, uh, governments uh, have more or less money in certain uh, votes or certain accounts, depending on, uh, on, on what their plans were and how well those plans have transpired. Uh, for example, you saw the Treasurer announce that uh, it looked like he might be slipping a billion dollars short uh, this year because of, uh, because of revenues. Sorry, he's now the Minister of Finance, not the Treasurer. But um, You should know these things. They sometimes create opportunities for you. Now, at the moment, uh, in most of these cases, uh, uh, there's contractions going on, so there may not be many opportunities, but in certain votes or certain accounts, again, maybe going back to ministries or programs that are in the ascendancy, they'll be protected. And if they're protected, and some of the things they plan to spend money on this year are being held up for external reasons, uh, then there may be money there that, uh, that you can take advantage of if you hit the, uh, hit the right hot button. Um, Turning to the Ray government, which is uh, what uh, both Carl and I were supposed to speak to and both of us have avoided getting into too much <laughs> detail on, uh, they're like all, it's like all governments. It's both different and similar. Uh, I don't think one ought to worry too much about, uh, about how governments uh, change politically, except as long as you keep in touch with those broad external and environmental concerns that I talked about. The thing to remember is you're the constant if you're doing the lobbying. Uh, it's your credibility, and the people you deal with in government expect uh, integrity, honesty, de and dependable behavior from you, and if you provide those things, that's much more important than the fact the, uh, the government has changed. Um, my, my political biases are, uh, are well known by just about uh, everybody in government. 
uh, I've never found that to uh, to be a problem, and uh, I've dealt with uh, uh, with all three major parties in government, and uh, I think that the main thing is that they know that I'm not going to embarrass them. They know that I'm not going to use my political bias uh, as a weapon in my work. And as long as they know that, and as long as they know that I'm fairly trustworthy, uh, it's no no barrier. And I think that's true. I look around again at a couple of people in the audience I know well, work with all governments, and have worked with great skill. So uh, the political party uh, bias doesn't matter very much unless, as was previously referred to, you want to start uh, making an issue of it. And if you do, then uh, you deserve the uh, the consequences because you're not there to play with your own prejudices. You're there to look after your uh, your client. Some specific things on the NDP. Uh, uh, they're a reform movement more than they have been a political party. They're in the process now of uh, trying to adjust to, uh, to being both a, uh, a political party and a reform movement, and it's, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, uh, the party uh, formed over the years, I would argue, uh, uh, as much in reaction to uh, their sense of lack of progress or lack of real reform that they found in the traditional conservative and liberal parties. Um, and uh, while that's a very effective uh, political weapon and eventually uh, uh, brought them to government, it doesn't deal with all the trade-offs that tend to flatten out governments from their, uh, from their political uh, rhetoric. So it's been, a, it's been a very difficult adjustment for this government. I suspect it would have been difficult anyway, but if you add to it uh, the misery of the uh, deficit that they inherited and the, uh, and the recession, uh, all piled on top of it, I think you would have to say that, uh, that this government has, uh, has special problems to deal with. Uh, so if you look at the uh, external environment uh, facing them, there are a number of political themes that I refer to in my paper, and they're not meant to be uh, um, uh, complete because that would uh, take too much. But you've got to know about these themes. You've got to keep them in the back of your mind. They haven't changed. Uh, uh, simply because uh, we have a social contract or because the, uh, the government is hard pressed for money. Uh, but the, how you may use them has certainly uh, changed as a result. A um, couple of, uh, of specific things. I mean, it's quite obvious. This, this government has to rebuild its political base uh, between now and, uh, and election and the election time, and that's going to be extremely difficult. They don't, don't have the money to do the traditional Canadian thing, uh, which we're witnessing for the first time in a federal election. There's no money to buy anything with. Uh, the same problem is going to, uh, to exist. So they'll be looking for innovative ideas. So if you have clients with, uh, with innovative plans uh, that can fit some of these things, you may get on the agenda. But the agenda is going to be harder and harder to, uh, to get on to. Um, a couple of things. This is a, a government, and, and uh, I think Carl alluded to it, where, uh, uh, where there's a lot of power in the hands of, uh, of the political staff, of ministers. And as a consequence, uh, it's good to keep them advised of, uh, of what's going on uh, and on top of things, not only for the usual reason of not wanting to uh, surprise the minister further down the line, uh, but because they're going to become involved in it sooner or later. And, uh, uh, because of their relative importance within the system, they're aware of their relative importance within the system, so you have to be able to, uh, to accommodate that. One, one uh, last specific comment, uh, and that is that the government has a somewhat different approach to negotiation than, uh, than I've encountered before uh, with previous governments. It's a little bit more akin to the kind of bargaining you find in the uh, collective bargaining between uh, management and labor, and perhaps that's some reflection of the, uh, of the background of some of the ministers. Uh, I don't think that that should give you too much concern, the fact that you may sort of run into a, uh, a hard line when you first encounter it. Um, by the same token, uh, as is true in those types of negotiations, they all, all also expect to give a fair amount of ground before the end, um, unless, of course, you have touched, as Carl referred to, one of the uh, religious aspects of. Uh, of the, of the policy. So don't be put off by uh, what seems like an impossible bargaining position at the beginning. Uh, uh, just get on with it. One thing, though, that I think is important to, uh, to make a distinction with in this government, and that is the difference between uh, the so-called religious issues and, uh, and the others. 
uh, at a certain point in time, if you think you're on the former issue, you're going to have to decide uh, whether you want to um, work on the edges and try and get some modifications that will uh, ease the pain of the impending policy legislation or regulation, or you can decide to hit the bricks and take them on head on. Uh, but chances of, uh, of success, I would argue, on, ta on hitting the bricks uh, have to be weighed pretty carefully because if the, uh, if the religious aspect is set in, uh, then you're dead meat. I, I remember a, a, cl a client who said to me in relation to the, uh, the labor legislation that was passed in, in, in June 1990, this was about March or April, Ron, uh, referring to the, uh, to the insurance success. Uh, uh, that we're going to be looking at in the next session, saying, uh, you know, what we did was we, uh, we brought enormous pressure to bear from all angles. It was a hell of a campaign. And when they felt the heat, they retreated. We're going to do the same thing on labor. Uh, that's another great pitfall. Uh, uh, that is the kind of most dangerous assumption you can make of any party uh, or any in, in government. And that is because one thing succeeded, the other will. An automatic reaction of government that has had to retreat in embarrassment from one issue is that they might rather fight to the death on the next issue than convince everyone out there that they're going to give in on every issue. And uh, indeed, the labor matter did wind up very differently from the insurance matter. And uh, <clears throat> whether we should perhaps someday, if we had the time, Ron, compare the, uh, the labor uh, uh, um, uh, with the insurance and, uh, and draw, draw some distinctions. I think that would make a hell of an interesting program. Uh, what, one is religion and one is not. <laughs> That's right. Well, insurance used to be religion. <laughs> yes. So there's two years left in the mandate. Uh, the government's got to uh, get the economy back to health while at the same time rebuilding its political base. An absolutely enormous challenge. So while there will be eagerness for new and attractive ideas uh, and reforms, the competition for attention is going to be considerable. So finally, going back to my opening comment, I think you'd best do your homework, know those environments, and uh, use them to develop the strategy uh, before you uh, begin to take your problem to the government. Thank you, Graham. We'll take a, just a few minutes for questions before a coffee break, and if I may exercise the Chair's prerogative to lob the first question. Uh, it's been suggested in the media that this government, uh, more than any others in the province of Ontario, has become politicized at the top of the public service. Uh, from a principal secretary in the Premier's office, a known partisan, very capable partisan, has gone to be clerk of the Legislative Council. Uh, suggestions that at the deputy and director levels, uh, partisans have been put in place. The traditional public service has been shunted aside. There's only, I think, four of the original deputy ministers who were there when the government uh, uh, took, took office, and that it's become a highly politicized public service. How does that affect the lobbying function as you see it? Graham and I talked about that a little bit at lunch. At least we talked about the principal secretary being a politicized appointment, and that seemed to us to um, create a situation where it is harder for the Premier's office to get what he wants out of the, uh, the various ministries than it was otherwise. Um, the Premier appoints the deputies, of course, and that has a politicizing effect. But it would be David Agnew's normal job to tell deputies what it was that the Premier wanted that ministry to do and tell them to get on with it. The one thing that's totally clear, I suppose, is that if the Ray government leaves, so will David Agnew. So you don't have the sense that there is a professional civil service that's there and that there is a, a team that should keep working. Now, I said I thought that could mean that um, a deputy would say, well, all right, I'll go through the motions because you're asking me to, Mr. Agnew, but um, you're going to be dead meat before too long and it doesn't matter whether I succeed or not. Um, Graham, I thought, was much more um, uh, kind, astute, and astute about it. He said, no, they'll, they'll probably do as they're asked. They'll, they'll do as they're told. But they won't warn the Premier's office when he tells them to do something that's going to be a terrible mistake. They'll, that's what we're being told, we'll do it. Well, the relationship one expects to see is one 
of collegiality and a program may be suggested by the Premier's office, but if there are going to be terrible things coming from it, you would expect more feedback than you may get in this situation. Uh, I think that that um, is um, a serious problem and, and I, have, I can't throw out examples at you uh, of how it has been a problem for the government, but I think it is bound to be an increasing problem for the government. It, it may be that it all happened because the government felt it wasn't having its agenda carried out and it had to uh, politicize if it was going to have its agenda take place, but I, I think they may reap the whirlwind on it. Yeah, I, I just wanted to clarify one part, Carol. I mean, w when I said that uh, they wouldn't uh, necessarily give uh, 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 f frank advice was really what I was getting at, not that they would uh, deliberately uh, let the Premier or the clerk go down the garden path, but if, uh, if you're concerned that uh, your message will not be well received and your message may be seen as uh, uh, as an attempt to uh, to block or to uh, pursue a philosophy different from the government's, then you're wise to shut up. And uh, in terms of survival, and uh, that's that's the atmosphere that the risk that's taken by having um, someone who's highly politicized in the clerk's position, because it's a key area uh, for government management that there be a frank flow of uh, of information, and that frank flow of information. From on the political side as well as on the administrative side is that uh, at various times if a minister is about to make a serious mistake uh, because a deputy is a premier's appointment it's not it's not inappropriate for the deputy to pass the word on to the premier so the premier can determine whether the minister will make a mistake and therefore stop it before it's made uh, if a deputy feels that uh, that he is going to uh, get in grave personal difficulty for uh, for calling the clerk or the uh, or the secretary of the cabinet and making this known, then uh, then he or she simply isn't going to do it, and uh, I think that's a problem uh, that's in the system. But I said earlier that uh, I have very strong feelings on the public service and uh, how it ought to be organized. But I told you earlier that strong feelings in such matters. Uh, 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 personal feelings didn't have much to do with the actual day-to-day -day operation of the job. Um, I've discussed this matter with the with the with the uh, secretary of the cabinet, as I'm sure Carl has. I have to say, in operational terms, uh, I don't see much difference, Ron. In fact, uh, mm -hmm. on a couple of occasions, I guess because the uh, uh, the secretary of the cabinet saw a political downside much quicker than maybe than. Uh, than, uh, than someone else may have seen it. I've actually got, gotten quite good, uh, good service uh, um, uh, from the clerk. So in terms of external, I haven't had much of a problem, but there's, there's no question that if you look at it from a, from a uh, public administration, public philosophy position, there are a lot of problems with it. We have time for a question at the back. Back to, um, and suddenly the, uh, the, minister, uh, the minister gets shuffled and consequently, you have a new minister and uh, and staff who aren't necessarily uh, at all aware of uh, your position. Is that correct? And you know, uh, I would say the same thing can apply to uh, to a deputy minister as well. Actually, uh, um, the first thing you have to do is tell the client that you've got a little bit more work to do than you expected. Um, now, if you follow, if, if it's a normal kind of matter and you followed the process properly, uh, that is that you've talk to the, uh, the key public servants and uh, uh, then you should at least have a body of knowledge that's, that's ready and if they're particularly positive about what you want to do, uh, then you might want to remind them uh, that perhaps this is something they should put high in the priorities for the, for the new minister's briefings so that you can get it uh, dealt with quickly and then if there are any problems, they'll let you know and you can then therefore more effectively uh, uh, address any concerns the minister might have and not lose too much time. But you're going to lose time for sure. Now if it's a kind of issue that uh, the department didn't like particularly but the minister did, then you've got a bigger problem. And there, But in those circumstances usually it will mean that you've also had good contact with the minister's office and in, uh, the previous minister's office and the, uh, and the previous staff. And if you've done that, um, you may ask them to make sure that there's a, uh, a special briefing uh, taking place in the change of the ministers. And uh, because if it's something that the outgoing minister is very keen about, uh, that outgoing minister may, uh, may wish to tell the incoming minister 
to, uh, to take it very seriously in terms of preserving their relationship in Cabinet if the Minister, for example, feels strongly about it. So th th those are some thoughts, but, but you will lose time, absolutely. You know, there's, there's no way to keep the momentum up when something like that happens, usually. With this government, uh, some of the political staff often stay in place when the ministers move, and that can be a help to you. There's also a tendency for new ministers to, uh, to spend a while being briefed as well by their staff as, by, as going out and having a series of meetings with essentially their constituency. Um, you can often use that as a way of getting an early meeting with the new minister uh, for your, your person, your client, as part of that series of constituency meetings, and you're going to want to get to know that person quite well and try and impress upon them that, that this was almost completed and it's very important and it's worthy and in the public good, all that kind of thing. Try and get an early meeting is all I can add. Second question at the front. Okay. Yeah. Um, just in, I know there's someone coming on later who will have a different perspective on this question, but uh, either of the three of you are aware of any uh, movement to put either the legislative or the executive branch towards registration at the provincial level? I'm not. I'm not, but I know Ron thinks it's inevitable. Uh, I'm, I, I have no knowledge of, of any thinking along this line at Queen's Park, but I'll bet as night follows day that within the next year, given the noise that will occur in Ottawa in early 1994, that something will occur at Queen's Park. Well, are there any? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, uh, I think uh, you have to deal with the opposition in different contexts. I mean, if it's, if it's obviously legislation and you're going before, before the committee, um, then you're uh, quite foolish if you haven't really uh, spent a fair amount of time with, uh, with the, some of the members of that committee and certainly the, uh, the, the parties that uh, the, the party representatives or critics that, that make it up and get your best case across. It doesn't even matter if they're if uh, you know that you have some uh, people deadly opposed to your position, you're still wise to try and talk to them because you may at least be able to persuade them of the merits of not attacking some aspects of your program or what have you. Um, in other matters, uh, I think it's, it's a discretionary issue. I mean, I've been in situation, for example, if you're, if you're dealing with uh, a plant closing, for example, which is a very public, or is going to be at a certain time a very public thing, then I think it's important that uh, local uh, legislators be made aware of it, whether they're with the government or not. Now, there are timing questions that, uh, that enter into something like that. In other matters, uh, if you're seeking legislative change, uh, you know, if it's particularly if it's a routine change, or you may want to just run it by uh, the other parties. Usually, in, usually if it's legislative or something like that, I like to talk to the government about it first or the government, rep the, the, the minister, or uh, uh, find out what their thoughts are on it. Uh, generally speaking, in my, uh, in my experience, um, uh, governments want you to, uh, to talk to the opposition at certain points in time when, uh, when, you're, when they're in agreement with you because they feel you may be able to help move the agenda along or get something that you, uh, that you agree to. Um, if it's a very likely to be a very controversial issue, then uh, I usually, to a large degree, take my cue from the government and only go to the opposition or use the opposition to stir things up when I, uh, when I feel that uh, I can't make much more progress with the government. The danger, of course, is that if you stir the opposition up and they take your cause to heart, <coughs> uh, you, you may kill yourself with the government. So you want to do it very carefully. I was involved in trying to preserve a program to finance community information centers, which the government um, wanted to kill, um, we ended up with deal dealing with uh, a great number of the, uh, the legislators, the, the members of the legislature of all parties, most of whom used these services and whose 
constituency staff used them. That resulted in a quite unpartisan set of support coming in from across all parties. That turned out in that case to be very helpful. But you, you want to be careful about how you use it. Yeah. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I think we'll adjourn this panel. And on your behalf, I would say thank you to Graham and Carl for a, a very useful discussion. We'll adjourn now for a maximum 10 minutes. Try to return here as close to 11.20 as possible to start the insurance panel. Thanks. I like questions. I like questions.